Welcome to Swisspreneur, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan and I will be your host. Today we are visiting Walter Wies, one of Switzerland's top law firms. They employ more than 200 lawyers and operate six different offices throughout Switzerland. We are going to talk to Alexander Eichhorn and Boris Rapper, both members of the Walter Wies startup desk. We cover topics like what's the lawyer's role when doing fundraising? Why is corporate housekeeping so important? These are usually tasks that are pretty boring, but very important to take care of as a growing startup. And also a very important topic, how to sell your company in an M&A or IPO deal. As always, there is additional content available on our social media channels. So make sure that you check out Facebook and Instagram. Let's jump into today's episode. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SBB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at sbbstartup.com. Boris and Alex, welcome to the Swisspreneur Show. It's a pleasure to have both of you here today. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to get started with the first question right away. And today we talk about scaling startups and the legal challenges that they face. So my question is, what mistakes do you see Swiss startups making repeatedly when it comes to scaling the business from a legal aspect? Contact the lawyer too late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. I think that that's one of the most common mistakes we see. And the repercussions of that mistakes can be massive. To, to make one example, last year I had a startup which was in a very good position, had a excellent business proposition to make, and the founders decided to negotiate the term sheet themselves. And once they had done that, they contacted us thinking that they had cut a great deal, which wasn't really the case if you had a look at the, the fine print. And although term sheets are non-binding typically, it, it is our experience that it is extremely difficult to deviate from their terms uh, and to backtrack on those. In, in fact, the founders gave up an amount of control over their startup, which exceeds what is typical for a startup in that stage uh, by by far. And it, it was a real uphill battle to uh, get most of that excess back from from the investors. I can imagine. So they sort of anchored it in a, in a wrong direction and then it was pretty hard to, to move back from... Absolutely. The only good thing they had was the price per share devaluation in the investment. I had a very similar situation with um, the client that came to us um, and said he wants to do an ICO. We said, well, um, of course, we, we can assist you with that. So he sent us uh, all the documents he, he made by himself and told us he wants to go live by tonight. <laughs> and then we said, okay, well, uh, just a moment. I mean, first we have to go through the documents and then we have asked him, have, have, have you ever have a lawyer looked uh, over the papers and have you contact FINMA? Because as, as you know, if, if with the ICO, always the regular law is uh, involved and so it's many times with an ICO you have to contact FIMA as well to get uh, a clear answer if you're for example if you're a fund or if you're not a fund so they, they didn't contact FIMA they, they didn't uh, contact the lawyer to go through the documents so and then we said okay well that's not possible to go live tonight. So to probably sum that up a bit, people often hire you as firemen instead of having you as preventive doctors for their companies. Is that a good summary? <laughs> That is, but you know, it's like with a dentist, if you go there too late, the cost you will incur uh, will be much higher and the result less optimal. So I would like to walk us through a scaling startup. Let's assume we have a tech startup and we want to go through growing the business until exiting the business and having hopefully a nice success story. Let's start with the first part. You have a growing business. That usually also means that you need more capital. So startups do some capital increases. 
what is the role of the lawyer there and what options do you have in order to increase the capital for your company? Well, I think when, when, when we're talking about financing round, uh, there, there's one very obvious aspect. Someone has to draft the documents. That's typically your lawyer. I would argue that this is probably not the most important aspect. It starts with project management where we have a lot of experience on how a financing round is to be conducted, what steps are necessary, aspects to be taken into consideration, and so on. It continues with commercial terms. Uh, we frequently have founders who have no experience or limited experience with financing rounds. They are not fully aware of what, what are market terms. It then, uh, of course, also touches on questions of structure of the financing round. As you know, there's a couple of options from ICOs to convertible loans to the classic capital increase, as you mentioned before. And uh, I, I think we're, we're involved in many of the aspects of the financing round. And I see our role often also as the uh, sparing partner of the client. Sometimes the client is the, the, are, is the founder or sometimes the client is an investor. And I see our role often as the sparing partner of them. Right. So your role is not only preparing the legal documents, but you're really also with your broad experience, you can also really help them to get a good deal that is like market standards so that they really have something that they can also be sort of That's proud of. I think, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, Boris, I think the project management and the coordination of the whole process takes really an important part in, in, in the whole financing round. Mm -hmm. And it is the difference between a technically sound lawyer and a lawyer who really brings value to the table if we can assist. And I very much uh, think we do the founders to, to get the best deal possible. Absolutely. You mentioned the different uh, structures of getting more capital into your company. I would like to go a bit more into detail there. Can you tell us again, what are the different options that you have a, a choice for when you actually want to have more money in your bank account as a company? And which way would you recommend for what kind of purpose or stage? Absolutely. Let's start with ICOs and uh, only because I mentioned them uh, first before. Pretty hot topic uh, at the moment. At least it used to be until yeah. a few months ago. We uh, definitely saw several requests for ICO assistance uh, a day until a couple of months ago. It has dropped down considerably and I think that's largely due to people understanding that not only was there a lot of mischief done uh, with ICOs and unsound uh, projects run, but also that it's not as easy as originally thought, which uh, absolutely makes sense. If you're looking at it from an economical perspective, an ICO and an IPO being the initial public offering on a traditional stock market have uh, very much in common. And uh, so it's not completely a surprise that the protection standards do not vary as much as some people uh, thought until a while ago. And also the level of effort you have to put in in order to, to actually realize such a huge project. I absolutely, guess. absolutely. So if I understand you correctly, for a scaling company, still a startup, ICO is probably not a really good option to consider. No, I think that's a, that's a very fair assessment. It was a very hot topic for a while. There were still might be some cases where it makes sense, but for the vast majority of startups, uh, an ICO is not what we would recommend. We have the more uh, traditional options of operating with uh, capital increases. There's different types, but that's purely technical matter. A capital increase uh, essentially means an investor gives the company money and receives a certain amount of shares in return. If that is not to be executed immediately, there's some middle ground on that, which are convertible loans. They're typically chosen in situations where you uh, want to avoid price discussion. With a convertible loan, instead of agreeing on a fixed price per share and executing, you can also hold off for a while, saying, for example, that the price of the next 
next financing round, which leads to a capital increase, is uh, used for the conversion of the loan into equity, very often connected with a discount compensating the the lenders uh, for the time between the grant of the loan and the actual execution of the capital increase. Because they also sort of take a bit more risk if they invest in a convertible loan. When do you actually suggest your clients to go with a convertible loan? What are sort of the circumstances that make that the better option? And when should you go for a capital increase? This very much depends on the startup. If you are in a position where there's not much discussion about price and where the amount of negotiation needed is not huge, executing a capital increase is usually the cleanest option. However, um, whenever things are a bit more blurred, capital increases do take a moment. How well, long approximately? It very much depends from what point in time you're starting to look at it. I think from the decision to actually go out there, find investors, uh, negotiate with them and execute in a Series A, you would be looking at three to four months, but we've seen that executed in two weeks. We've seen cases where it took well over a year until the project was concluded. A convertible loan, on the other hand, you can, in many circumstances, sign the next day if the terms are commercially agreed. But when we go back to uh, ICOs versus uh, capital increases, just a word, it surprised me very much. A couple of, well, let's say one or two years ago, when you did an ICO, it was much easier to raise the money than, than with a traditional uh, capital increase. It, it seems that no one cared about the business model. You just have to mention that you are doing an ICO and the money f flowed in. But that's not the case anymore. But that used to, to, be, to be the case when, when, when ICOs were very uh, common and very popular. Sounds a bit familiar to the gold rush feeling back yeah, in the exactly, dot-com bubble, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the capital increase a bit in more detail as the traditional go-to way if you agree on the price with your investors. What documents do you need in order to have a successful capital increase? Well, typically you start with a pitch deck with which you visit a uh, sometimes large number of investors and try to convince them of the project. If uh, there is mutual interest in uh, proceeding together, you would uh, very often execute a NDA, give the investor a chance to have a closer look at the company, be that part of a formal due diligence or on a more informal basis, depending a bit on the size of the financing round, the stage the company is in. And you would then proceed to the negotiation of a term sheet. Term sheet outlines the essential cornerstones of the agreement uh, under which the investors are ultimately investing in the company. That is not only the amount of money uh, he's willing to invest and the shares he's getting in return. That also includes the shareholders agreement, very often agreement on the employment undertakings of the founders, play participation plans, in some cases, strategic partnerships on an operational level, and so on and so forth. And once that is negotiated, typically on a non-binding basis, an investment agreement is prepared where the terms of the term sheet are outlined in more detail in a binding manner. And once that is signed, we're only looking at what we call corporate documents being the subscription forms for the new shares, payment of the investment amount to, to a bank, which offers a blocked capital account, a public deed on the shareholders meeting resolving to increase the company's capital, public deed on the board's resolution to extra, actually execute the capital increase and then filing with the commercial register to mention the core documents of such a capital increase. But that, that's more the corporate than the, 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 ca, uh, the corporate documents. That's not as fascinating as uh, the, the entire part before that. Um, I think with your broad experience in that regard, you might also be able to share some hacks or tips with us. When it comes to commercial terms, what you would recommend to the startups, actually how they should negotiate. I know this is very individualistic and case specific, but also 
sort of success tips when it comes to managing the whole process in order to get it done faster or get it done in a better way. What are your hacks and recommendations in these two areas that you can share with us? Well, we, we discussed that before. I think what, what is very important, and I know Alex concurs, is that you have a clear view of what you want to achieve. Meaning that by the time you're visiting investors, you'll have a grand plan in your mind of what you're actually out offering out there, the terms uh, you're willing to provide. Of course, they, they, they're not set in stone, but it's helpful to know where you're trying to, to end up. It, it also makes sense if you're a founder or, or a startup that you draft the documents and do not start with templates of the investor which anchor you in a probably more investor-friendly starting position to start the negotiation on. Is there anything specific that founders should sort of watch out for when they, for example, as you said, receive templates from the investors term-wise? The, the small print? Yeah. I think w what is important is to not only look at the valuation. Valuation is important, but if you're uh, neglecting things like liquidation preference, thinking that this only comes into play if the company goes bankrupt, while in reality it typically includes also exit scenarios, you, you risk there by having a much less attractive deal from a commercial perspective than you think you are because a liquidation preference very often says, at least that's one of the structuring options, that under certain circumstances, the investor receives a, a amount of money before everyone else does. That could be the investor receives the amount he invested plus an interest of 6, 7, 8, 10, 12 percent per year before any of the proceeds of an exit are distributed to the other shareholders. What is your recommendation there? Like, I know it's pretty common to have these liquidation preferences, but what is your, your take on that? What would you recommend startup founders? Like, do you accept a simple, a one-time uh, liquidation preference or should they try to negotiate that? Or is that also very case specific? That's extremely case specific. I would say if your case is interesting enough, you will get away without any liquidation preferences. If it is still very unclear whether you will have success and uh, you're running out of cash, the negotiation position you're finding yourself in is a tad less attractive. So it's basically all a question of leverage. Leverage and I think all the negotiation skills. Now assume we got the money in the bank, so the company is well financed. And now we want to hire more employees in order to also kickstart the growth that we want to achieve. Yes, then you are employ hire more employees. And for that, you have to have, of course, the employment contracts, the employment agreements. And you have to take care that they are properly drafted because they are very important. You have to be clear what the content of such an employment agreement is because the content, uh, of course, it's very important. And there, I mean, probably the, the most important part of it is the, the salary element mm -hmm. because when when it comes to a, to a problem with such an employment uh, contract, normally it's all about the money doesn't it you, you do not fight over one week or two week holidays more or less you fight about the salary element and you have to i mean there are uh, there are possibility you have fixed salary a uh, variable salary you can have a bonus or, or whatever you want but yes and once you actually discuss these terms, I mean, there are also other aspects besides the salary that you need to include in such an employment contract. For example, IP rights can be very important for startups. Absolutely. IP rights are very important. Non-compete and non-solicitation uh, clause. Employee stocks and vesting are very important for startups. Maybe we can tackle them one by one because I think these are all very important topics. So regarding the IP acquisition through the company, basically, you want to make sure that the company owns the IP rights, right? How do you do that? What is your recommendation? How, how do you handle that in practice with the employment contracts? There 
is a legal provision in Swiss employment law that the IP developed as part of your employment tasks belongs to the company. It is certainly worth it to expand that a bit to secure the right to acquire further developments done on the occasion of executing your job, but not as as core task of your employment. And it's also very important to be aware that uh, jurisdictions have different rules on IP acquisition and ownership. And what we do is uh, we make sure that we have a very extensive IP clause ensuring that whatever the employee does for the company or produces which could have a benefit for the company actually belongs to the company. Because for many startups, that's their core asset and uh, there's little which needs more protection than that. And that's also very important in case you eventually want to sell the company, I can imagine. <laughs> it certainly is, yes. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on the uh, exit aspects later on, but it, it is one of the items which is verified whether the asset which generates the value for the company actually belongs to the company. Then you also mentioned non-compete. How do you handle that in an employment contract? Well, at least, I mean, th- th- these are more or less uh, standard clauses and they are uh, limited by by the law. So, for example, you are not allowed to, or I mean, it's a case-by-case um, uh, basis, but you are not allowed to have a non-compete for, for 10 years or, or 20 years. So that um, you could basically never work again anywhere. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Or, or you, you're not allowed to have a non-compete for, for a whole Europe, or, or, for example. So that's, that's not possible. But then still, that, that is sort of a hard balance to make, I can imagine, because at, at a certain point, you want to protect your company, that you cannot go to your competitor and just replicate what, what you actually learned at company A, and then go to company B and do the same. At the same time, you also cannot forbid too much or limit the people too much. How do you have a balance that is actually good for the company from a startup perspective? It's certainly a difficult balance to strike and not an item where you look at non-compete clauses on a standalone base, but you're also taking such aspects into account when you're thinking about notice periods for the termination of the employment where it might be more interesting for the company to actually put someone on a garden leave, fire them right away. But it, 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 you need to have the big picture on it. And ultimately, uh, I think the success of a company is determined by how uh, well it does its own job rather than what it limits its uh, competitors and former employees to do. So certainly an aspect to be taken into consideration, but one shouldn't overdo it. And uh, one actually is not legally allowed to overly impose on one's employees. Sure. You also mentioned a notice period in that regard. The topic hiring and firing uh, is important. So what should you basically include in the employment contract to be able to sort of split ways in a good way that you uh, don't burn the bridges? Difficult question because when you're asking a lawyer, you're probably getting a legal answer. This is largely also a communication and, uh, and personality uh, issue. From an employer's perspective, it's certainly worth noting that if you have an employee who is no longer willing to work, you cannot force him. In Switzerland, the police does not show up at your doorsteps and take you to the office if you're not very motivated to show up there. So having extreme long notice periods may provide some safety on a non-compete aspect, but does not ensure that you will never find yourself without an employee who would need to perform a task. So uh, a balanced approach certainly makes sense for both ends. Do you differentiate between sort of the type of employees that you have? So does it make sense to, for example, have a longer notice period for certain employees and a shorter for other employees? Or should you have the same for all of them? Typically, you would see longer notice periods for uh, more senior employees. 
And in, in a startup, one is not to forget that very often there is employee participation schemes in place where leaving the company has consequences as well. So again, it's a big picture analysis to be undertaken. And not only the, the more senior, but also the, the more you're specialized, the longer you have a notice period. That's right. That makes sense. You mentioned the employee participation. I think this is a very big and also important topic for startups to not only incentivize their employees, but ideally once they make it big, uh, to also generate enough capital to hopefully invest in the next generation. Um, what, what are the options that startups have there to incentivize their employees with uh, participation rights? You're absolutely right. Incentivation is a big topic. The lack of funds in a startup is another driver for, for why there, there is uh, so many startups which offer employee participation plans. In principle, you can divide those in equity plans and non-equity plans. An equity plan, in the end, provides an employee with shares in the company. While a non-equity plan, often called virtual share plan, phantom stock plan, and the like, is a contractual promise to pay a certain amount, typically calculated on the basis that you're treated as if you had a number of shares under certain circumstances. For example, in case of an exit, if you hold certain amount of shares, uh, virtual shares, you would get the equivalent participation in those exit proceeds as if you had real shares. Both equity and virtual plans typically provide for a vesting. Vesting means that you might be promised a certain maximum amount of shares, but you're not getting them from day one, but you have to earn them. Uh, you could have a positive vesting, which means every three months or every year you get a certain number of shares or a negative vesting where you get all the shares at the very beginning, but have to give them back if you leave earlier than that. It doesn't make much difference which approach you choose, also not from a tax uh, point of view. That vesting is a typical part of both equity and non-equity participation plans. When talking about leaving the company, it's uh, differentiated between what is called a good lever. A good lever is a person who leaves the company on grounds which are not blamed on, on the employee. For example, the company fires that person due to lack of financial resources to maintain the employment. Nothing uh, the employees to blame for would uh, be a typical case for a good lever, while a bad lever leaves the company without having had good cause to do so. Maybe because he's fed up with the boss, might uh, prefer to work for a competitor and, and the like. And in, in that case, uh, you're considered a bad lever. Good levers get to keep the shares which have vested over the period the employee has been employed with the startup, while bad levers usually have to return the shares for no or only very limited compensation. The choice between an equity and a non-equity plan depends on a number of considerations. The, the main item which speaks for an equity plan is that if you're acquiring actual shares in a company at the fair market price and you were able to sell them off later on for a much higher price, you will have what is called tax-free capital gain, which is a very great thing to have. It's pretty um, cool that you have that in Switzerland. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> certainly one of the big advantages of the uh, Swiss tax system uh, Absolutely. For, for startups. Well, you don't get that with phantom stocks, for example, right? No, you do not. Phantom stocks or virtual plans in general only result in a payment once a predefined event has occurred. So you have nothing to worry from a tax side before that point in time but you're taxed with income tax on that. And depending on how uh, successful the exit is, that might be considerable amounts. Absolutely. Are there any other aspects that you should consider when choosing for any of these two equity or non-equity plans? 
as a startup company, you have to take into consideration whether you might have employees who feel less motivated if they do not own quote unquote real shares in the company. That that very much varies in our experience. There's people who have a very strong preference for, for being actual shareholders, being able to attend shareholders meetings and the like, while others are more driven by financial considerations and they just look at uh, what do I get out of it and what, what, what are my tax consequences, what is the overall result, and if that matches their expectation, they're fine. There is one more aspect which is crucial. If you're giving out real shares to employees, you will have a cap table, which is considerably larger, especially if you're very generous with those share grants, uh, which of course also means that whatever you want to do, you have to invite those employee shareholders to shareholder meetings. They very often need to be part of any exit deals. And by part, I mean contractual parties. With the proper elements in a shareholders agreement, um, that is not truly an issue, but it certainly is uh, an administrative task, right. which uh, increases uh, w with the number of shareholders. Basically means more work for you to keep everything up to date. Indeed. Absolutely. Um, you also mentioned vesting. Um, what are the, the common terms that, let's say the market terms? I know from the United States, they usually have like a four year vesting period. Is that also something that you see in Switzerland? Three to four years is very common here as well, often combined with a one year cliff, means before the first year you get nothing if you leave. And the four years vesting period means that over the, those four years in monthly, quarterly, half yearly, yearly periods, you, you get a certain number of the total shares you should end up with after those four years assigned. Right. What do you recommend in, in terms of the timeline there? Do you recommend to have monthly vesting or quarterly or annually? I would advise to, to not have a monthly vesting, Why not? Uh, especially not if you're talking about uh, real shares in case you don't have a share option plan, but an actual share plan where you distribute shares because uh, you end up redoing the share ledger every month. It is fine to do it on a quarterly basis, and uh, that, that's probably also market standard nowadays. Now you have the capital, you have the employees, and now you're scaling the company like crazy. And I know startups can be quite hectic, so also quite chaotic, and you might forget important things, which can also reflect legal things that you did not really think about. I think you sort of summarize that as corporate housekeeping. So you want to keep your company or your startup house in order. What do startups often forget in that regard when they are scaling massively but don't really think about the other legal things that should also be done and what should they be more aware of? You mentioned the corporate housekeeping. That's, uh, I mean, the whole corporate housekeeping itself, it's very important for the startups. Not only if you are looking towards an exit, but also if you are looking toward the next financing round, the, the next investment round, because a potential buyer or a potential investor will look through the legal documents of your company. And if you, you do not have proper, for example, a proper chain of title, a proper share history, if you do not have the minutes from your board meetings or from your general meeting, it just doesn't give a really good picture of your of your company and i mean the whole corporate housekeeping to to have all these documents in place to have the signatures on 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 the documents to have the proper date on it etc etc i mean that's not very sexy and often uh, the 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 startups they they don't really value that very much because it it doesn't I mean, they do not earn money out, out of it. So right. They want to develop products. They want to talk to clients, yeah. get more sales done. Yeah, but it's very, very important when it comes to an exit or to the next investment round. So how, how do you handle that? Is that something that startups can do internally if they are really good? Or is that something where 
they actually also need some support, probably from lawyers or from someone else. We typically provide a sample structure for a corporate housekeeping or for the legal aspects thereof, whereby we think that the, the, the vast majority of startups is in a good position to, to actually do the filing themselves. We're, we're happy to assist, answer questions. Corporate housekeeping in a wider sense, of course, also means that you have your day-to-day -day documents available in a way that you find them when you need them. Uh, that you will also be able to, to retrieve the information if an employee who handled a specific task uh, leaves. These documents, would that be like sales contracts or employment contracts or what are these like day-to-day -day operation documents that you're talking about? Absolutely. And, and of course, documents like, uh, like the share ledger, the, the beneficial owner register, documents like this. Employment agreements, we, we've had various cases where uh, there was an employment agreement once, but we have no clue where it is. It's not, not a good position to be in if you're facing action from a disgruntled former employee. Absolutely. Or if you want to sell the company, no matter what, you don't want to be in that position. Maybe it's also, you know, if, if a startup is not able to keep up with that work, they probably shouldn't be running a company. You could also put it that way a bit more aggressively, maybe. Yeah, that's a harsh stance to take. Many of the, 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 the founders involved in a company are extremely smart, especially in their specific field of interest. But a lot of them do not have management experience. Some spin-offs, for example, who, who have among the, the greatest products on, on the market, they, they lack commercially experienced people. So they might very well be able to develop a, a good product, but uh, do, doing the accounting and keeping binders, it's just not their thing. And uh, I, I fully understand that. It's uh, not one of my hobbies either. So, so I wouldn't say they shouldn't run a company, but maybe they should have one more person in, in the team who, who can help out with that. They should hire for it, basically, to uh, get that done. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. But I mean, to be honest... It's not only with startups that they sometimes do not have a proper corporate housekeeping. It happens with, with big companies as well. That's good to know. I think that's a good reality check. So yeah. startups so are not, not the only, only one who and, have and challenges. And I mean, in, in almost every due diligence you see, especially if there is an old, old uh, company involved, y you have uh, a lack in the chain of title. I mean, that's, that's very, very common. Meaning that you cannot prove that the shares you believe you own are yours. That might be because there has been some legal issues and share transfers or because you simply may not have the full documentation. Now, let's go to the next step. You grew the company. You scaled massively. So hopefully at a certain point in time, you also have a net positive cash flow. And that also means at the same time, you will also have to pay taxes, basically. What should startups sort of take into account regarding taxes and what should they be aware of from a legal perspective? I think that's a very nice place to be in for a startup who has just decided to scale its business. Most startups, especially while they're still raising money, are not in a phase where substantial profits are made. And at the very beginning, you're making losses. And when you start making profits, you might be able to set off a part of those profits with the losses and not pay taxes on it. So, so you're pretty far advanced once you're actually paying taxes. And I think Switzerland is a fairly attractive tax environment compared to lots of other countries. There's, of course, some cantons and cities with, with lower taxes than others, as you know, uh, from your individual taxes you pay. And there, I think one item to note is that by having a mailbox in Zug, do not become taxable in Zug as a company. If you have all the employees in St. Kallen, the premises in St. Kallen, and you uh, work out of St. Kallen, having a mailbox in Zug is not illegal, but you will still be taxed in St. Kallen, even if you have the corporate seat in Zug. Uh, I, I think overall, do not 
overestimate the the tax impact uh, the, the choice of domicile has. There, there is, of course, uh, some structuring options when we think about holding companies. Very often that comes at a bit later stage and it's not a situation a startup finds itself in from, from one day to another. This is basically after the, you successfully manage the growth pattern and Absolutely. are a more established company. That's when you face these questions not too relevant for startups, basically. Important considerations, but, you know, employees might want to work in Zurich because they like the little big city and could never imagine to work somewhere else. And, and then deciding to relocate might save you a few bucks in taxes, but losing all the employees is not really an option. I think accessibility, living standards, uh, environment are probably more important considerations for quite a while in the startup life cycle. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, it's basically consider taxes. They are important, but don't put too much effort or too much thought into Absolutely. that topic. Absolutely, especially not too early. Exactly. So maybe you're not profitable as a startup company, but you might still be a very attractive takeover company that somebody wants to actually buy your company. There are several ways of how you can actually exit a company successfully. Um, can you walk us through the different options that are available to startups if they want to create a successful exit? Well, I think there are actually two possibilities. The one is the merchant acquisition possibility so that you, you actually sell, sell your, your company to, to someone else. Or the other option is that you do a, an IPO. An IPO means an initial public offering, so you will become a member of the stock exchange. Exactly. And which option should you choose? Are they like different deal sizes or do you need to be at a certain point in with your business where one makes more sense than the other? Most of the exits are sale of your of your business either share deal or asset deal or, or whatever i mean ipos are not rare but but not very common at least in in startup switzerland there are like i think almost non tech or startup ipos yet because i think there's a good wave coming up in the next three to five years hopefully. Yeah, and, and it i mean it's a big step to become a listed company at the Swiss Stock Exchange. But what does that mean? You, you also need to probably to have investment bankers involved and it's also a huge uh, due diligence process, I can imagine, where you have to make Absolutely. a lot of because, files public. Absolutely, and you have to prepare a prospectus and for the prospectus you have to make a due diligence process and you have to, um, to, to inform the market about your numbers and, uh, and uh, you are now then a public company. It's, it's it's not only a costly but also very time consuming effort. It's it's difficult to say how long it takes exactly, but one and a half year would not be a, a bad guess. And uh, an IPO is truly only an option for a company who has already achieved a, a very reasonable size, uh, both. In, uh, turnover and in development stage. So you won't find a startup doing IPO. Uh, you might find a former startup who has ventured in the at least medium-sized enterprise area to, to think about an IPO. But as you mentioned, not very common as of now. We, of course, uh, hope that there is many Swiss startups who are extremely successful and who will make it to the market, be that in, in Switzerland or abroad. But that's not the, the, the typical exit scenario for, for a Swiss startup. And, and once a company considers an IPO, you can hardly uh, call it a, a startup anymore. Probably it. You mentioned that there are certain levels that you need to sort of achieve before an IPO actually becomes even an option. Is there sort of a limit where you say, like, you should have at least, I don't know, like hundreds or 10 million revenue below that you should not even consider doing an IPO? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily base it on, on uh, revenue, but if you're looking at cost of several millions for an IPO, 
you wouldn't want to do that for companies whose value is clearly below that. And it would also be a struggle to, to find uh, an investment bank or an investor in the stock market who is willing to invest in a small company. It's a huge exercise. So huge. hopefully we'll see it in the future. But currently, this is not really a, a way that Swiss startups uh, pursue at the moment. It's very rare, at least. Yes. Uh, so so we, we're essentially with an M&A process. We're, we're uh, looking at the sale of the company. That can be to a uh, strategic investor. That can be to an equ- a private equity company. That can be a management buyout. There, there's many options for that. And essentially, those are split up in two types of deals. Uh, there are uh, asset deals where you do not sell the company, but you sell the company's assets. That usually includes also employees, uh, business relations, uh, and so on and so forth. That is fairly uncommon in Switzerland due to the tax-free capital gain, which you only get if you sell your shares. Well, in, in, an, in an asset deal, the startup sells its assets, has a lot of cash and has to dividend that out to the shareholders. While in a share deal, the shareholders of the startup get to sell their shares, which, of course, under uh, certain circumstances and uh, with limitations, result in a tax-free capital gain. So that's the typical structure. It's also the structure which is technically a a little bit easier to execute on because the object of the sale uh, economically, obviously, is the company. uh, But technically, you're selling the shares and you have to think about how many desks are we selling. It's not really an issue for an asset deal either, but in an asset deal, you're in principle, selling every single asset on its own, of course, in an amalgamated manner for a total price. But but that's the, the less uh, common structure. Makes sense. So let's have a detailed look at this share deal for an M&A process. How does the whole process look like? You probably either sell the company or there's a, an interested buyer coming to you. So you, you know whom you want to sell it to. How does the process from there look like until you actually sell the company, get the money in your bank account? Once uh, you have identified a buyer, which is a process not unlike the, the hunt for an investor in a financing round, and we're talking about identifying a potential buyer, that buyer wants to have a closer look at the company he or she might be buying. And for that needs access to a very comprehensive documentation of the company. Such access is typically only granted after a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA is signed, which uh, is the point in time you enter into the due diligence phase. Uh, On that day, you will be extremely happy if you have done your corporate housekeeping work. That's where Um, you see where it actually makes sense to focus on that earlier. That goes back to the corporate housekeeping, yeah. Because otherwise you will spend weeks digging through old documents and trying to prepare a data room which is where you upload those documents uh, for review by the potential buyer or buyers and and, and then it depends uh, a bit uh, how exactly the deal is meant to, to occur if you have only one buyer you end up negotiating with that buyer alone if your company is very attractive and there is a number of potential uh, buyers, you might actually have an auction where you prepare an SPA and uh, on that basis with a limited amount of adjustment, check who is willing to pay you the highest amount. Sometimes it's not, it's not only money, but also some consideration on how will the employees who have become very close to the founders of the and shareholders over the year be treated afterwards what do we think is a fit certainly also do the founders remain part of the company uh, will they continue to be the company's management and so on is negotiated and uh, 
Then you come to, to the big day where you sign the contract. Uh, you might then uh, find yourself in our offices, in which case you're uh, lucky. We're uh, very happy to, to assist in, in such a process, which is very often an emotional moment for the founders giving away their baby or at least a part of that project. They have spent years of hard work making it grow. It's uh, usually nevertheless a, a very exciting moment. There are a, a number of uh, founders who are extremely happy with uh, the transaction and uh, proceed to a great closing dinner after the deal has been uh, finalized, sometimes followed by an even better closing party <laughs> later uh, in the night. I heard there's a nice rooftop in your office uh, where you can also <laughs> sort of celebrate the nice exit. Absolutely. <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're happy to contribute a couple of bottles of champagne to, uh, to the successful closing of a deal. Just uh, one quick addition, you mentioned the SPA. Uh, I think it's important to quickly explain this is a share purchase agreement, the actual buying contract, right? Yes, it is. It has a simple part that is the part where you say that you sell shares. Then there is typically a more complex structure where the price is defined because very often you don't have a fixed price. But you have a fixed price element and then you have an earn out depending on future development of the company. Can you um, give us an example for such an earn out? How would that look like in practice? Well, let's say uh, five millions up front. And then if the uh, EBITDA uh, over the next three years grows in excess of 5% per year, you get 20% of that total EBITDA, or uh, you can also define it with uh, milestones that there is almost no limits to, to structuring options you have there. So lawyers can be very creative in that regard there. <laughs> <laughs> we can, buyers can. I think that's a great chance for, for everybody to, to bring his or her ideas onto the paper. And this is actually also a good thing because that way you get a certain value upfront for what you actually created. But the value that we create also needs to last over a longer period of time. For example, for a three year earnout, then you would participate if everything goes well and still delivers value, you have an additional upside. If not, the upfront payment is all you get. Absolutely. It, it allows you to not have to determine the final value of the company, which is also largely dependent on its future development on uncertain assumptions. But you can actually find a formula which reflects what, what you as a selling or a buying party believe the, the company's development will be and, and thereby come to a fair price. That probably also makes negotiations much easier. I find price clauses to be one of the items where a lot of time is spent on and uh, certainly one of the, the clauses which is looked at most, more closely than, than others. You know, in an SPA, you typically have also a number of uh, representations and warranties where the buyer requests a number of assurances from the seller that the company actually is and owns what the seller claims it does. Those are, of course, also very important protection measures for the buyer, but maybe a tiny bit less the, the focus of uh, attention on the sell side uh, of a deal. Probably sort of sum, sum up the, the exit part or how you actually sell a company. I think it would be interesting to hear about the biggest deal breakers. We already heard one uh, is if you don't have your corporate housekeeping done in a, in a proper way, that could basically cost you the deal of selling your company. What are the other circumstances or, or basically points that can come up and uh, kill your deal? The biggest deal breaker is to tell too often that that's a deal breaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, corporate housekeeping, if you don't have it, it typically does not kill the deal, but it really delays the deal and might have an impact on the price. So, so it, it is nasty, but usually 
if there is a deal breaker, it is commercial terms where the parties cannot find an agreement uh, on the price. And, uh, as we just discussed, price elements also not find an agreement on a mechanism how to reflect the different uh, views that they might have. But it's clear if the, the founders uh, believe they should sell the company for uh, an amount which is uh, several times higher than the total budget of the buyer, uh, it's not going to be a deal. And, and very often, personal aspects play a role as well. If the parties get along well, the, the entire process is uh, much smoother. We, on our end, make sure that we as a lawyer or we as lawyers do not end up being uh, deal breakers, but uh, aim to facilitate the transaction. For most issues you, you can find in such a process, that there are solutions. And most, most deals go, go through. Okay. How much percentage-wise, approximately? Just a rough ex estimation. I would say at least 90%. So if you actually take all the efforts and also if, 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 if start with lawyers? If you're in the process, um, drafting, SBA, etc., then, then no, normally the, the deal goes through. It's also basically a huge investment that you take to a certain degree. Time and yes. probably also money-wise. Yeah, it is. On and both you don't have to forget that uh, while you're in the process of selling the company, the show must go on. You can't pull all the people from their uh, daily jobs just to fulfill the needs of the transaction. So it's a it's a very stressful period for everybody involved on the company's end. Takes nerves, uh, late night calls, uh, weekends, tough time. And how long does such a process take? Approximately, I know this is again very case specific, but is it more like three to six months or more like one to two years? That again depends on the case as you said it takes usually longer for larger companies it takes longer the more advanced a startup is if you're already at a very advanced stage where, where you have a group of companies where some restructuring measures might be necessary to conclude the deal Let's say you're looking at the startup which has uh, three product lines. You're only interested to, to buy two. If you need to get that third out before you sell the company, that will take time. It, it depends on how many parties are involved, what jurisdictions, uh, no, well, Jurisdiction is maybe too much thinking uh, as a lawyer, but it very much depends on uh, where the parties are from. There is more formalistic approaches in, in some countries. Others are, are more relaxed and laid back on the transaction. It uh, depends on the lawyers uh, engaged on both sides. There is certainly a lot of room to make things complicated and over-engineered. It depends on liquidity on the, the pressure to uh, sell the company. If you need to sell the company for financial reasons urgently, that uh, might result in a heavy discount on the, the price you, you might uh, be, be able to, to get for your shares. Absolutely. My last question for uh, today is probably a bit tricky because this is very, very case specific. But I know that startups also at the later and growing stage, they still need to watch their budget because they don't have access to unlimited funds. So how much money should they actually, uh, you know, save for having good lawyers working with them for capital increases, for corporate housekeeping and for a potential exit scenario? That is indeed a very case by case matter. We, we find that the legal expenses of a startup's form curves like waves. There's a number of peaks. First peak being to, to actually set up the company, get everything in place, and, and then you're probably done for a little while. Then you have your first financing round, which results in, in costs uh, second, third. You get to a point relatively early where employment starts to matter. You might have some little things here and there, but it's a certainly also true that transactions such as a sale of the company do result in a raise of legal fees. 
it's really impossible to say how much or uh, how, how many percentage of the budget you should allocate. Budget is a very good word in, in that regard. As you do the financial planning, you should think ahead what legal needs you might have and budget them in so that you're not taken as a surprise. Then it certainly also makes sense to, to talk with your lawyer and uh, explain them what your plans are, where you stand liquidity-wise. You might find that there is some flexibility as to the billing terms, which can exceed uh, the, the mere what is your hourly rate question, uh, where you can also uh, have alternative fee uh, models, for example, allowing you to uh, pay uh, the cost of a financing round or an exit after the transaction is closed. There can be a, a discount if the financing round or the exit is not actually close successfully. We're, of course, also very happy to take premiums if it does. Fantastic. Boris, Alex, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure was ours. And best of luck and hopefully some IPO deals for you guys in the <laughs> near future. We look forward to them. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed our content, please rate us on Apple iTunes. For our next episode, we're going to welcome Tommy Brandley. He's the CEO and founder of Run My Account. We're going to talk about the challenges and financial advice for later stage startups. A very interesting topic for all growing companies. So we hope to see you again next week for an all new episode of Swisspreneur. Until then, have a wonderful day.